I, I can tell you it's such an honor to be here, and it's a double honor to be here again, because many of you, um, I met you last year, and I know you've worked with Amanda and Lauren and our team, but to have us come back is just the most awesome thing. Um, <clears throat> so today's talk, we're going to start out, and I'm going to do a, um, a brief review of HOPE and the four building blocks of HOPE. So I want to make sure everyone's on the same page, people who were here last year, people who were here last year, but you know, maybe didn't cram for the final, um, and, and everybody else. So I, I just want to start out by acknowledging that I get to speak, I love speaking, um, but we have a tremendous team. They're now, believe it or not, as of May 1st, there are 10 of us all together um, who are spreading hope throughout the country and a few other places. Um, so I'm sure you, you've met Amanda and, and Maura. Um, <coughs> Dina runs our research program. Um, so who else do we have here? Um, then, uh, oh, Courtney Weaver has just joined our team, so she joined me first, then she took vacation. <laughs> we'll see her get back. Um, Lauren, you've met Laura as a research assistant who works with Alice, and, and the two of them do our policy and network work. Because a lot of what we do, we talk about individuals, but it's adults' responsibility to create a policy environment that allows all this to happen. And they're working hard on that. Um, Isabella is our project coordinator, and Quinn Tucker, another research assistant, and Dan Choi is our communications manager, who just started May 1st and um, is already just like a crackerjack and making us look professional. So it's really good. Okay. So a short review of the HOPE framework. So first of all, going back to the beginning, HOPE exists because positive experiences help children grow into healthier, more resilient adults. I've had to convince you about that. Gamlin talked about the positive experiences that helped him be resilient and become a resilient, healthy adult, even though all kinds of stuff happened. And that's something that we see. And the goal of the HOPE framework is to take those of us who serve children and families, who work with children and families, make us more knowledgeable about those experiences that allow children to grow up, um, grow up optimally. We didn't invent this. There's been a bunch of people before us. Um, anyone ever heard about the power of showing up? <laughs> so there's the power of showing up. There's strengthening families. There's a science of the positive from the Montana Institute. Essentials for childhood um, from my Uncle Sam and CDC. Um, there's um, Johns Hopkins, Christina Bethel, talks about flourishing. Because why do we say that it's enough not to have all this damage? Why don't we say that we need to flourish? And, and Dr. Bethel is just so clear about that. Um, we've had a little bit of work with the National Indian Child Welfare Association who talked to us about positive Indian parenting. Um, with the Search Institute, those of you who work with teenagers may know about the 40 positive community assets. Bright Futures, I'm a pediatrician. Uh, Bright Futures talks about family strengths, calls on us to call out family strengths. Um, and faith traditions. So we work with a few faith leaders who told us that actually people knew about this before they knew about science. It's wonderful. Um, and I say this all because while what we're talking about is not new, what HOPE does, the HOPE framework, gives us a way to think about this and a structure to apply it in our own work and to make progress in helping children and families. So, and the goal of this is that in traditional work, and someone just told me um, about a program that she went to as an adoptive parent, and they talked to her about ACEs, and, if, and said if children have ACEs, you may as well just cash it in, right? Because it's terrible. It's like you drop your coffee cup, right? <laughs> it's gone. Find some other way to drink your coffee. And that's not true, because we're not just the pile of our deficits. Each of us has both. But what hope does, and, inspire, and using hope-inspired care, is it creates the, we join a narrative that people are, you can understand them by their strengths and their stamina, as well as by their challenges. And if you do that and move aside the initial encounter with someone where you catalog everything they're ashamed about, everything bad that ever happened, um, it changes us, it changes our patients and our participants, and it changes our relationship. So the, begin, the first scientific thing for this, and we talked about this last year, was a 2015 
um, study that was done and published in 2019 um, <coughs> that, that talks about, that asked people in Wisconsin about um, their positive and adverse childhood experiences. And so we asked them about those in the context of a, of a scientifically valid sample. And then the questions we asked were, how often did you feel able to talk to your family about your feelings? How often did you feel that your family stood by you during difficult times? How often did you enjoy participating in community traditions? How often did you feel a sense of belonging in high school? And we just heard from Galen about his feelings of belonging at high school and what the counselors did, what his coach did. Think about how powerful that is, that one positive experience, what turning point it is. I uh, felt supported by friends, have at least two non-parent adults, like that room full of guidance counselors who are looking for poor lost Galen, uh, who cared about him, right? That's really important. Um, and feel safe and protected by an adult in your home. And just like the ACEs scale, you get one point for each of those, so you can have zero to seven points. And in the initial work we did in Wisconsin, it was kind of stunning from a survey research point of view. People who had six or seven of the seven possible positive childhood experiences, 87% had good mental health, which in this case, limited definition, no history of depression, and currently good mental health. Compared to those who only had zero, one, or two, who fit half of them had good mental health. What a, what a change. And then those of us who are thinking scientifically, you always like to see middle, you know, middle uh, ex exposure, middle result. So that all works. But time has passed since then. And I just want to show you that this work continues. It's really cool. Um, so this is from, anyone recognize where this picture comes from? Shout it out. Yellowstone, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I actually enjoyed watching Yellowstone. It's violent, I shouldn't, but I did anyway. Um, so they did, they recently um, analyzed the 2021 um, BRFA study results in Montana, and they're interested, as many of us are, in drug use and overdose and those things. They analyzed it and they showed that the presence of positive childhood experiences reduces cigarette smoking, reduces alcohol consumption, uh, lower lifetime odds of any substance abuse, and in particular, lower lifetime odds of illicit drug use. So think about that as a modern plague. Many people die now from drug overdose, many people suffer. Uh, positive childhood experiences can help with that. That's in Montana. Not to be outdone, if you slip a little south and you go to Tennessee, they also analyzed recent purpose results. Um, and what they found, and it's on the Department of Health website, is that positive childhood experiences, um, lower rates of depression, similar to what we found in Wisconsin, lower rates of heart disease. What is the number one cause of death in the United States? Heart disease. In particular, cardiovascular disease, and independently, PCEs protect against cardiovascular disease, and no surprise, I did the giveaway, heart disease is the most common cause of death. Overall, improved physical health. And really important for, um, are there any bean counters here, people who work with the state or the city? Um, employment, right? So the people who have positive childhood experiences are more likely to enter the workforce and be productive. Um, so that's, so, so far we have Montana and Tennessee. And, and then if we skip over to Australia, we now have, uh, we're now partners with Western Sydney University, which is the Australasian Center for Hope. Uh, it's kind of fun. Um, and they have something called the Longitudinal Survey of Australian Children. They took 5,000 Australian children born in 2004 to 2005, and they asked them everything. They took all their blood and all this stuff. And they did that every two years. And then they published last year a study that showed that having positive childhood experiences at any of those two-year intervals during childhood made kids less likely to have poor academic performance, act higher academic skills, and likely to report better mental health as young teenagers. So think about it scientifically. The first set of studies were thinking back to when you, as an adult, were a child. What do you remember? And that's wonderful. And this one is looking forward, and it's like, what do the scientists who asked you and your parents questions 
all through your life, what do they find about you in particular as you grow up? So this is the hallmark of something that's real. It's really valid. Um, and there are scientists now working on this. I've heard some talks from people who do various things to mice and show that mice respond to positive experiences. Who here's a parent of a teenager? Okay, so you're gonna be jealous of mice now. Adoles adolescence in mousehood lasts 10 days. <laughs> So, <laughs> there you go. Okay, and finally we're now doing work, um, we're partnering with the Center for Disease Control and looking at more work that's being done around the country using those same behavioral risk factor surveillance things. This is new data, it hasn't been gone through all the checks and stuff, but it seems pretty valid, so I'm gonna show it to you. If it's not true, I'll send you like a recall notice. Okay, um, so what we found, looking at people from now four states um, who answered this at various points in recent history, people who had more positive childhood experiences were more likely to have income, household income over $50,000 a year, which is the highest bracket in this survey. They were more likely to have a college degree, and they were more likely to be employed at the time they answered the survey. So we talk about health, I'm a doctor, I care about health and disease, I don't like heart disease, but what we want for ourselves and our children is actually to thrive. So going back to what Dr. Bethel talks about, that flourishing, finishing college, having a decent income, pretty cool. Positive childhood experiences can set you, can set you up for that. And then you get a job. So the pathway that we think is going on is that Positive childhood experiences make us healthy and resilient and lead to good health outcomes. And I put this up here because if you think about what we know about ACEs, it's half true, right? Having adverse childhood experiences can affect our brains and our bodies and make us have poor health outcomes. But I think the way it really works is that these are the things we need and having adverse childhood experiences blocks them. So if you think about it, if you're abused or neglected, what does that do to your, your feeling safe at home? So we'll go into that in more detail, but I think that what we need are, are these positive experiences. So talk a lot about equity. I want to point out that the original ACEs study was done in a fully employed, largely white population in Southern California um, in the 1990s. And I don't want to shock anyone, but it turns out that Southern California is not exactly representative of the entire United States. Okay. Um, and it's been replicated over the years. We have to be really careful in what we're studying. Um, it's been replicated in different populations. It holds true. When we talk about PCEs, our first study was done in Wisconsin, not the most diverse state in the country. So we're now looking at South Carolina, Tennessee, um, still Wisconsin, and Utah, uh, another state, okay. I'm standing here in front, I'm a little nervous. It's one of those states. Utah might be this year or next year, but a lot of people, much more diversity, so we'll be able to really hone in on, on are these things experienced differently um, by different groups of Americans. So remembering there are 10 kinds of adverse childhood experiences, three kinds of abuse, um, physical, emotional, sexual, two kinds of neglect, physical and emotional, and five kinds of household dysfunction or household challenges. And interestingly, this was done in the 1990s, so the study was published in the 1990s, say it was done in 1995, a relative with mental illness, with an incarceration, and this at that time was mother treated violently. We now know that infant partner violence can go both ways. Um, substance abuse, divorce, and I always think about this because Think about what adults reported they grew up in a home where there had been divorce if they were asked in 1990. So presumably their parents got divorced in the 70s or earlier. And think about the difference in society and the acceptance of separation then and now. So I'm wondering whether this is a, a frozen snapshot in time because there's a lot of stigma about being divorced if you got divorced in the 1960s, early 70s. And now it's still not easy and it's not great, maybe, sometimes it is, anyway, but, but it may be different now. So think about this, everything we do is a snapshot in time. 
But regardless of those comments, um, what happens here is the CDC has done a lot of research and carefully linked these adverse childhood experiences to poor outcomes. So injuries, mental health, maternal health, infectious disease, chronic disease, risky behavior, and opportunities. So the glass is half empty side. There's a lot of evidence there, right? I just showed you some evidence that maybe when the glass is half full, that's good. But I mentioned just a moment ago, this was done in the 1990s. And one of the great discoveries of the 21st century is that humans don't grow up in isolation. We grow up in families and communities. And I say that a little bit in jest, but actually not really. We've gotten much more sophisticated about understanding the physical and social environment that supports or doesn't support families. Uh, Wendy Ellis at George Washington um, did this well, wonderful study along with Bill Dietz where they looked at adverse community environments. So if there are problems in your community like poverty, discrimination, community disruption, lack of opportunity, poor housing or violence, those can be the roots of adverse childhood experiences. Now, you can have all those things good, so adverse childhood experiences, but they're a risk, right? And notice it doesn't say whether you're black or white or urban or rural or language um, you speak or how many parents are at home. All of those things that are happening in the community really affect the ability of parents to do what they really, really want to do, which is raise children and raise children well. And there are a lot of things that block that, that get in the way, but it's rare to find people who don't want the best for their children. It's not, unfortunately, rare to find people who have trouble with that and children who have things. But I got here because I want to just point out that in that original study, and we're planning to reproduce this with the largest study now, um, <clears throat> among those Wisconsinites who had four or more ACEs, so four of the three kinds of abuse, two kinds of neglect, and five kinds of household challenges, if they had those and they also had positive childhood experiences, 21% had poor mental health. If they had those four ACEs, and did not have the buffering of those positive childhood experiences, 61% had depression or poor mental health. So when I was listening to Galen's story, I heard about Peanut, I heard about the school counselors, I heard about his coach who took him in, I heard about his father who, despite all of his issues, cared about him. So a lot of positive experiences went along with a pretty difficult childhood that you described. And now putting it together as synthesizing as an adult, he's able to see and communicate and draw from that we're not simple. We are much more complicated than a bag of aces. Um, not that the not that trauma is good for you, aces aren't important, but they're not everything and they're not destiny. Oops. Right. So I want you to think for a minute about somebody who you know, either someone you, look, you see when you're in the mirror, someone you've heard speak, someone in your family, who had a traumatic childhood and is flourishing like an adult. I'm not gonna call on you to say who it is or tell you their story. Hold that person in your mind or heart because we're now about to go into the hope framework. And I want you to think about that person in the way, sort of like what Galen told us his story, um, like just tick off what made it possible for them to flourish. And I do this because I'm going to give you lots of data and lots of science, but it's also really personal and it also reflects our actual lived experience as human beings. And for many of us who work with people who have various sorts of, tro of troubles, it's really important to keep that in mind. And so when we talk about it, um, this is from Rebecca Grace at Western Sydney University. Um, and she took Wendy Ellis's tree and she added all these things in green. So think about opportunities for employment, accessible health and education services, a safety net, children who feel valued, diversity is celebrated, safe neighborhoods. These are roots that can set up positive childhood experiences like opportunities to play, being surrounded by friends and family, having a safe, stable home, attachment, engagement with the community, enough money to pay the bills, um, opportunities to learn, access to healthy food. Those are all different kinds of positive experiences that can grow in a tree that's rooted in these positive community environments. Um, so if you think about that person, think about were there things in the environment that may have helped them. 
And I want you to let that sink in, that positive childhood experiences really matter. And hopefully each of you is thinking of an individual person who is doing okay, even in the face of ACEs. And we'll talk about it. It doesn't mean that it didn't affect them, but it means it didn't define them. Okay, so here are the four building blocks of hope. So relationships, safe, stable, secure relationships. Um, and these begin with you look up, you've just been born, you look around, there's a person who gave birth to, say hi. Uh, and during that first year of life, when you, what we learn is love. That's about it, right? Um, and then it goes on, we make friends, so the other kids in the sandbox, um, school, um, eventually all kinds of peer relationships, and as we heard from Galen, otherwise having two or more adults who care about you, those relationships really matter. The second one is the environment. We talked a little about that, but I want you to think about physical and emotional environments. So I think, are there any rural areas in Mendocino County? <laughs> okay. So part of the rural environment is not just protection against the weather, but also protection against isolation. And how do people make those connections? What is that environment like for them? Um, as well as enough food to eat, enough money to pay for um, transportation, to pay for, do you guys need heat in the winter here? Okay. <laughs> Another California myth shattered. <laughs> <laughs> All, all of those things. So the, the concrete supports, concrete environment, as well as the emotional environment. Um, <clears throat> engagement, a chance to feel like you matter. You can be engaged. Um, we'll talk about it in a second. I can say, I'll say this for the next slide, but engagement is really important for kids. Um, and finally, emotional growth. And emotional growth happens through peer play. If you watch five and six-year-olds play, they bicker. They have the rules, that's not fair, it's mine, whatever. What you're watching isn't bickering like old people, it's bickering because they're figuring out what are the rules of life and they're growing emotionally. They're learning that I have a viewpoint, but so do you, and I win sometimes and I lose sometimes, and if I am a gracious loser, we get to play, we have to play the game, and if I throw myself on the ground and throw a tantrum, not so much. And that's learned, and your peers are your best teachers. And the other kind of exposure, of course, is to nature. Um, and it's soothing and healing for us as adults, an emerging amount of literature that just shows the kids who grow up with animal access to animals and nature and trees and ocean, it provides a grounding that we need. So looking at relationships, um, what adults do is we set up a world that allows these things to happen. And so often we put everything on the back of parents. Parents are important, I'm not gonna deny that. Um, but think also about coaches, about the faith community, about neighbors, about play groups, and about each of you in your work. Because you're all professionals who work with young people. And we heard a story from Galen about the school counselors, what an effect they have. So we're all part of this. Those relationships really matter. And if we think about the transformation between standard care and hope-informed care, as far as relationships goes, think about what we do in work, right? So when we work, <coughs> relationships, thinking now about little babies, right? We screen for intimate partner violence, that makes for not good relationships at home. We screen for maternal depression. Also, so those are deficits, they're important, they're challenges, they can get in the way of relationships. But maybe when we do hope, we should also be thinking about how do we promote early relational health? How do we promote, ask people who helps you with parenting? One of the most powerful questions in the Bright Futures guidance for pediatricians is asking parents of babies who helps you. And it gives you a, a window into their lives and also communicates the very important message, you're not in this alone, nobody can do it by themselves. Right? Um, who helps you? And mentoring. Formal mentoring, informal mentoring, all of those things. How does this all work? Um, so, so the difference, the hope transformation, is in addition to screening for the presence of challenges to the building block of relationship, we're also doing work to promote those relationships. Environment. Um, so looking at, looking at the environment, this is all about the, like our community environments, right? Community playground cleanups, 
And I don't know if it happens here, but in some cities, um, some playgrounds have um, hypodermic needles, huh. right? Not good for kids. Playground cleanups, make it safe to play. Access to bus fare to go to parks. Training for school teachers and daycare providers to respond to bullying. And free lock gun lockers so kids are safe at school. Kids are safe at home. When you hear about some of these tragedies, you know the kids got the gun at home, and maybe if the gun had been locked up, they wouldn't have had the gun and it wouldn't have been that tragedy. So again, standard practice, ask about the environment. Um, is housing stability and quality overcrowded, good condition or not, intimate partner violence for the emotional environment. But look at what, what the other things we can be looking into and promoting with a hope framework. So we can promote and think about a positive school environment. Positive school environment, there are many things written about that. But it's really simple, actually. Principal teach, te the principal treats the teachers well. Teachers treat each other well. Teachers treat the kids well. Kids treat the teachers well. And the kids treat each other well. And in an environment that is a positive school environment, children thrive and just much less bullying. Um, thinking about recreational opportunities. Does your school district, for example, charge for out-of-school time programs? If they do, it impoverishes the situation that people can afford it because they can't play with all their friends from school. And for kids who don't have the resources, it blocks their opportunity for, um, for that kind of environment where they can live, learn, and play. And we now call family check-in. We used to talk about family dinner. Who here has heard all this stuff about family dinner? Okay. Family dinner is wonderful. If you can do it, it's the best. I enjoyed it when I was growing up. I enjoyed it many times with my kids. But some people work two shifts, or there are all kinds of things. But the core of family dinner isn't the food. It's the routine check-in with parents and kids. So you don't have to wait till there's a problem. You have some kind of thing that happens in a pretty regular basis so that you know about each other's daily lives. Um, engagement. Um, so first of all, who likes our logo? Anybody raise your hand if you like our logo. Good, thanks. Because <laughs> Gail and I were chatting at the beginning, and he said that he feels a lot of companies came to him, like he met that coach who was so wonderful because he's a talented athlete. And these, are, these logos were made for us by Artists for Humanity, which is an after-school arts, arts, arts opportunity for kids in Boston Public Schools. They get paid for doing graphic arts. We hired them to make our logo, and it is just the best thing. And so a lot of, a lot of banners and things around the city are made by AFH kids, and they have a thing every year where they sell their art. But instead of being that kid who's not paying attention in class because you're always scribbling, um, you're an artist. And the outcomes are spectacular. The kids do really well. They finish high school. They go on. Um, it's kind of cool to see that. So for other families we know, playgroups are important, family volunteering opportunities in the community, family roles and jobs, chores at home, so that you know that the, how you're, it matters that you're there. If you weren't there, the dishes would never get done. Right? So having that being part of it is important. Uh, the one about emotional growth, or excuse me, the one about engagement. Um, hope and form practices, do you feel like you belong at school? Are there family chores? Um, we do out of school time. And I think for most of the programs that we're part of, we talk with families about this, but there's not like, it's not part of the checklist of our jobs. Um, so emotional growth happens um, through peer playing, through nature. Uh, it's modeled by naming feelings. One of my favorite children's books is called C is for Curious. Um, it's kind of fun to go through that with a four-year-old and have to explain what xenophobia is. X is a hard letter for people writing alphabet books. Um, providing unstructured playtime for peers and practicing breathing techniques. So when you feel yourself getting angry, take a deep breath, right? Not so complicated, a four-year-old can understand that, but giving them those tools for emotional regulation. So again, if you look at what a standard practice, who here is familiar with something called the uh, ASQSE? Okay, a lot of us, right? Screening tool for problems. It's 
good screening tool, but it's a screening tool for problems. Um, and similarly, social emotional learning, anger management classes. But okay, I keep, I realize all these slides have playgrounds on, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Um, um, Child-centered play, green spaces, cultural and spiritual practice. This is where emotional growth happens. We could ask about that. It's not screening for a problem, which you need to do, but it's going the next step and seeing what is there to support that. And we talk about this, it's really important to remember, they're the four buckets, the four building blocks of hope, um, or the four balloons, as teenagers want to call them. So we had a group of teenagers who told us that building blocks are wrong because blocks hold you down and hope lifts you up. So they want us to call this the four balloons of hope. So who thinks we should switch? Okay. All right, we're going to provide alternatives. <laughs> um, so what goes into the buckets depends on you, your culture, your resources, where you are, what you believe in. So we worked with the National Indian Child Welfare Association. We learned how important it is to get your child dressed up in regalia and bring them to a powwow. Okay, not my culture. But that's what engagement means. And I have to say, one of the joys of living in a country as diverse as this, when you throw out these building blocks and you're gonna do it later this afternoon, you get all kinds of answers and they're not all the same. So we don't prescribe, you have to do this or that, we listen. So the building blocks seem to have seemed to be kind of separate, right? They're just different blocks. But let's put it all together. So if you think about the HOPE framework, our role, and our role means adults' role, is to create environments that are positive, that support positive relationships, that support positive childhood experiences directly and through those relationships. And, oops, and these experiences allow the children to engage in developmentally healthy activities. And then what happens when this is all working really well is you get this positive feedback loop. So children have opportunity for social, emotional, and cognitive growth, makes them more able to participate in all of these things. You get a really delightful, positive thing. So these things you know, used to bother me, right? That, okay, that experience, which, which bucket does it belong in? Well, actually the buckets are all related because it's the adult's role to create environments that support relationships, that support positive experiences, that allow children to be engaged in those developmentally appropriate activities that are, that are the foundation of social, emotional, and cognitive growth. And any, everything you do feeds into each other. So beautiful way to think about it because it really is all together. And we've implied this, just want to call it out. Hope is a multi-generational approach. It involves kids, it involves their parents, often their grandparents. Um, and the health of all of them is, is important. You can't have positive childhood experiences if your parents aren't physically and emotionally healthy. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> we've also put out that there's a lot of bias in the world. And some of the bias is because individual people are biased or prejudiced or discriminate. And part of it is because these systems have been built up over generations that embody all of that stuff, some evil, some just thoughtlessness, because the people making the rules um, are not necessarily people subject to them. So when we do hope as an anti-racist framework, we start with the data. Is there a racial disparity in what you see? So one of the examples on our, on our toolkit is children getting suspended from preschool. We know children getting suspended from preschool is a disaster, right? We know they're also really young. It's one of the characteristics of um, students in preschool. Um, but the people that get suspended from preschool overwhelmingly black boys. So there's a racial disparity there. And it has long lasting effects on the child and on the family. So once you realize the data shows that, the next question is engage the community. What's going on here? What can we do to fix that? Because it's not that the, the little boys are behaving beautifully and somebody just says, today's the day I'm gonna pick on a little black boy. There's stuff going on, right? But overwhelmingly, there are other things that you might do. And then once you do that, can you prioritize reducing the disparity and change the policy? So that in this example, the kids get more support or more structure so they can stay in childcare and it doesn't cause this ripple effect of the family. 
So here in Mendocino County, um, there's a lot of health data, and I think that you all, have they all seen this before? Some have, some haven't, okay. Um, so, um, it turns out child abuse is not a positive childhood experience. There's a, a fair amount of it in Mendocino County. Um, and the thing I want to point out here is that um, overwhelmingly, serious child abuse happens in kid less, kids less than one. Anyone here work with programs that take care of babies? Okay, great. And now raise your hands. Were you ever a baby? Raise your hand if you were a baby. Okay. Uh, keep your hands up if you cried when you were a baby. <laughs> okay. One of the triggers for child abuse is baby crying, right? And I think we've demonstrated that baby crying is not an abnormal behavior. That what's going on is other things are happening in the lives of the adults that make them unable to cope with a normal, unwanted, maybe, child behavior, right? Similarly, temper tantrums when kids are older or teenagers discovering their sexuality without their parents' permission. Um, sure, no one here ever that was not our personal experience, but it happens. Um, but having said all that, so these are the normal things. So you look at the adults. We know that adults who have more adverse childhood experiences themselves are more likely to not have a vast repertoire of things. When we look at parents who spank their kids or otherwise um, engage in, yeah, maybe not child abuse, but not good, um, they've often tried other things. It's not like their first go-to thing. So how can we support parents who love their children, want to raise them, um, and, not, and not abuse them? So the point is that it's kids so young, it's really hard to blame a six-week-old for crying, right? Um, and then there's a racial bias. Um, certainly American Indian children's, uh, children are reported um, much more frequently um, than other ethnicities here in Mendocino County. Um, people living below the poverty line. Um, so this is a proportion of people in Mendocino who live below the poverty line. And Mendocino is not the poorest county in California. California is not the poorest um, state in the country. The United States is not the poorest country in the world. Um, but we have a lot of children growing up in poverty. And it turns out that the poorest segment of the United States population demographically are children. So that places their families at stress. And going back to the previous slide about who gets abused, families in poverty, all of a sudden they have more expenses. These babies want diapers. Who knew, right? Um, and they have, and often they'll cut back their working hours because they have to. Um, so the economic stress becomes more severe. And the other thing about this is just remember, and this is not like long-term memory. A couple of years ago, we made a substantial dent in childhood poverty in the United States um, during the pandemic. There were payments to families from the child tax credit. There was expanded unemployment insurance for parents who were unemployed. There was expanded SNAP benefits for people who needed food. Um, there were community efforts. And literally millions of children were lifted out of poverty during that period. And as a result, we saw child abuse go down during that period. So the fact there's so much poverty in Mendocino County means there's opportunities for the adults to create a supportive environment that helps those supportive relationships, help children have those positive experiences, and sometimes as simple as alleviating poverty and its effects. Um, and then again, looking at people who live below poverty um, in Mendocino County, like in much of the rest of the country, people most affected by poverty are, are, are black um, families. And I know there's work going on around reparations and all those things, leaving the politics society, taking care of a multi, a very diverse group of people, you're going to see more black families in the group that's experiencing economic stress. So I think about hope as an anti-racist framework, starting with the data. Children under one and Native American children are highly overrepresented um, in your data. Children under six and families of color are highly affected by poverty. So the question is, how do you engage? How do you engage around these issues now that you know this data? Are there things you want to find out through community surveys or focus groups or town halls? Just think about what we can do by talking to our communities about what do families with little babies need, right? And some places end up with diaper banks. Other places end up with parent cafes where every week people get together 
and complain about their children <laughs> with the support of other adults who are going to do the same thing, right? Except for you. No, no complaints. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, so think about that, and, and just talking with your clients. They have a little baby, or they're experiencing racial discrimination, bring it out in the open. Because you're not gonna make someone feel discriminated against because you ask about it, just right out there. And the answer has to be co-created with the community. There's one more concept I wanna get. Who here knows about trauma-informed care? Oh my God, this is great, <laughs> okay. Um, so who knows about triads? Okay, so this comes from Alicia Lieberman and her group at the University of California in San Francisco. Um, and San Francisco is a southern suburb of, of Ukiah, right? Okay. Um, and so what, she's, what they've done is they say there are three things that affect outcomes, and you can use therapeutically. Adversity, distress, and strengths. Simple way to think about it is really simple, right? So if a person comes into services because they're feeling some distress, Something's going wrong. They're not taking the school bus, <laughs> or there's an alcohol problem, whatever it is, because of the services. So a standard trauma-informed approach is to go backwards and ask what adversity, what happened to you that led you to have this problem that's causing distress? The other thing we can do, though, is also look at their strengths. So what strengths do you come here with, and how, what strengths can you develop? Can we help you develop? They'll help you overcome the adversity that's leading to your distress. So let's take a case, and this is just a sample case for discussion. Um, Tara, 15-year-old uh, girl in an adolescent intensive outpatient program for her drinking. She's in foster care, was referred to the program after repeatedly showing up drunk after lunch at school. If you know a little bit more about her, she was in foster care since she was a toddler because of parental substance use. Um, she was moved to a new place at the beginning of this school year, and when that happened, she lost contact with her peers, she lost contact with her gymnastics program, um, and here she is. So moved homes, moved neighborhoods, lost all of that. So when you do a hopeful case review, you're really just asking those three questions, right? So look at her. What adversity might she have experienced? And we'll get to there. There's a lot of kinds of adversity she experienced. What's causing her distress? right this moment, what are the symptoms or the behaviors that are distressing, and how can we understand her strengths and build on them and help repair them? So when we do case discussions, and we have a bunch of cases, and you can do this too, what we find out is if you look at that story, and just, hey, it's only like four sentences, five, I can't count very well, a few sentences there, right? And just pick out some of the things. So adversity, what went wrong? Parental substance abuse, a new placement just this year. Let's just jump off the page. Those are adversities that have happened to her a long time ago and more recently. What's her distress? What's, what's wrong? Um, appearing drunk after lunch. That's distress. Something's going on there. Um, and she lost contact with her community, also causing her distress. So she feels isolated and she has a drinking problem. But then look at the same story, really quick encapsulation of her life, right? So we know that she lost contact, but she had close relationships with her peers. And she was in a gymnastics program. So she felt good about being upside down and flipping around. Who knew? Why would they do that? Um, but she did. And now she's lost those contacts. So now you begin to think about how to help her with the strengths. Can she reassociate with her old friends? I don't know. How far did she move? Is there a way to facilitate her seeing her friends? Can she do it by Zoom? Can they go in person? Whatever. Um, if she's a gymnast, can she be on a real gymnastics team? Is there another team she can be on? How can you see this not as a victim of all those things we talked about, but as a young gymnast who really knows how to tumble and flip and all those things and enjoys it? and gets that feeling of belonging and engagement because she's part of a team, she runs into the adults who may take her under their wing. So there you have from her history some of the keys. And this doesn't say she doesn't need therapy, she doesn't need an approach to alcoholism as a disease. She needs all those, but it says it's not enough. You also want to build her up not just as a diseased 15-year-old with a disease of alcohol use disorder, but as a 15-year-old who's got the potential to make friends, 
who has this joy in gymnastics and has these challenges. So how do you think about all of that? So we're going to do this more this afternoon, but think about what you're doing every day to promote those positive childhood experiences. And First 5 Mendocino is on the cusp of becoming a hope-informed organization. We're going to be launching a new program, okay, I'll say it, this fall, <laughs> um, for hope-certified organizations. And part of it is about supporting family strengths, um, providing anti-racist and culturally resident care, creating and amplifying the hope building blocks in the work that we do, and practicing continuing quality improvement. The only thing I can guarantee you in life is you, you, we, nobody gets it right the first time, but there are all these ways you can do continuous improvement, and if we involve parents in the community, we're going to get better at it. And how to get there? It's not so complicated. Um, first is leadership commitment. Who here is a leader in First Five Mendocino? There you go. Do you guys feel committed? Okay, we got it. Leadership commitment. Because if we train people and talk with frontline workers and they go back to work and their boss says, you have 17 forms to fill out <laughs> before lunch, um, I don't really care about hope. You got 17 forms to fill out. It doesn't work. It creates this thing. But if the leadership believes in it, then you can begin to examine your policies. You can arrange for staff capacity building. There are five people already in First Five Mendocino who are capable of providing hope training as we speak today. Um, and then develop approaches for continuous quality improvement. And part of what we're doing in our innovation laboratory that we call the Hope Innovation Network is developing these little QI tools so that as you improve, as you, improve you, can, you can monitor what's important. There are six standards for hope-informed practice. Once uh, again, a preview, commitment to the, commitment to the transformation, check, right? Um, a comprehensive framework knowledge, check. Um, supporting family strengths and resiliency, so programs, when you, whether it's your intake forms or whatever, do they support family strengths and resiliency, as well as catalog and address the problems, provide anti-racist and culturally resident care. I think you guys are on the path. I think we're all on the path. I don't know anybody who actually does this perfectly yet. Um, create and amplify the four building blocks of hope. We'll be doing more of that. And then practice continuous learning and improvement. Um, understanding with honesty and humility were that we're going to do it, some things will be great, some things will be improved, and even if it's perfect now, will it be perfect next year? I don't know. Um, so we look forward to working with you and other organizations through this process um, that begins with these standards of the organizational self-assessment, and then Amanda and Lauren and I and the five hope facilitators or any new hope champions are there um, to provide training and TA to make it happen. So I want to finish by saying I am so unbelievably optimistic about what's going on now. And I can, I can tell you at lunch all the people we've talked to, all the things we've learned, all the stories we've heard. But what we have is this understanding that children's brains grow in response to positive and adverse experiences. And the HOPE framework describes those positive childhood experiences that happen in supportive environments, uh, ideally in a home, maybe in school, but in these supportive environments. And these experiences and relationships promote engagement, and they promote social, emotional, and cognitive growth and now that we know about this, we're beginning to see a sea change in how we approach. So thank you for making the sunrise. Thank you.